So, herzlich willkommen zur dritten Veranstaltung Convex uh, Analysis. Welcome. Um, so, there's a question in chat um, about projections, but apparently there's no vote yet, as far as I can see. Um, okay. Um, so, anything else I should uh, announce before we can start? So, I, I probably will not talk about the question until there are a few votes. It wouldn't make too much sense to do so. Um, so, first, before I would start with the lecture of today, I would recall um, the notion of projection we had last time. Um, so, actually, last time was mainly about uh, cones, um, but um, we will uh, you also introduce the notion of projection, and that's very important actually, projections onto convex sets. Um, okay, so let's um, let's recap um, what the projection onto a convex set is and what these properties are. <coughs> um, and then if there would be some votes in the chat, I would also um, discuss the question afterwards. So first, uh, so what we need to recall is um, if we have C, uh, yeah, and let's take it always non-empty, um, closed, and convex. Then um, so, and then I imagine such sets sets of less like like sets like these. So everything which is on this side here belongs to the convex set C. <coughs> um, and then if you have for some point x zero, which I usually draw outside of C, but could also could very well be inside of C. Um, so they have some point, and then. Uh, the orthogonal projection onto C has been defined as the point in C which has minimal distance um, to that x0. So projection depends on the notion of distance. We are in Rd and always use the Euclidean distance. So that's uh, yeah, everything is as we do with the uh, um, compass and ruler on the, sh on the paper sheet here. So but this is so graphically, um, uh, graphically yeah, which one may it, may it be? It's not really totally clear. Maybe it's like, maybe it's this one here. Maybe this guy here is the projection onto C of x0. And the important thing is, um, these points always exist. If C is uh, convex, closed, non-empty, uh, the projection of any point C onto, uh, on any point x0 onto C always exists. Um, and it's also unique. It's also very important here. Um, so, but, um, and then defin definition was, it's the point in C which has minimal distance to x0. So, but well, this is not always very, uh, not always good to, uh, to work with. Um, a more handy characterization is the following. A point y um, is the projection onto C of x0, if and only if, <coughs> for all x, which comes from the set C, it holds that the inner product of x0 with y and x with y minus y, x0 minus y with x minus y is non-positive. Um, so first, why it's handy we will see in a second. It's really useful to use this characterization of projections when it comes to the next notion of separation today. Um, and so why should this be true? So what does that mean? Uh, it means that some point in C, which is, we, we can choose any point in here, but this point is the projection of, um, of x0 onto C, if and only if um, these two vectors here, the, this vector here and this vector here, um, they form an angle which is larger than pi over 2, so larger than 90 degrees. Um, <coughs> so, and, um, so what are these vectors? Um, so one need an arbitrary point x and, uh, and C, which may be here, um, and then uh, this vector here is the vector which goes from y to x0. And so y is, so if this, so it does take as y the projection, so this is this vector here. And this here is the vector which points from y to x. So this vector here. So what does this mean? This means this, this, this angle, the angle between these two vectors is larger than 90, uh, larger than 90 degrees. Or put differently is if you add some point and walk at the closest distance, the, the closest path you have towards the convex set, and if you reach that convex set, and then you want to reach any other point in the convex set, you need to turn not much, only by a degree, uh, by an angle less than 90 degrees. 
So if you say here, and this is the convex set, and you want to walk towards that set at the closest, so the such that you walk the closest distance, so the, the shortest path from your point to the convex set, you end up at some point on the boundary. And if you then want to reach any other point in the convex set, you need to, to change your path so very slightly, um, less than 90 degrees to go here. Okay, <clears throat> and um, so if you take any other point, um, then, this, then the projection, then maybe this point here, and if you then walk there, then you can find the point which is over here, and then this degree, so that, that's why make it a little bit more precise. So if you, so why is this not the projection according to this the characterization? If you go here, um, then you could take that point here, and this degree, the angle here between would be less than 90 degree, but it has to be more than 90 degree, more or equal to. Okay. So still no votes on the question, so I just leave the question as it is, um, and we'll see. So in case you see uh, you voted and I just can see it, uh, just let me know. Okay, so that was that, and now um, yeah, let's move on. So what uh, our third chapter is called projection and separation. Um, so we go on with the projections. Um, and then we talk about the very, 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 very important notion of separating convex sets by hyperplanes. So the first um, theorem is um, dealing with projections onto cones and polar cones. Uh, okay, and then so the situation with the polar cone and polar cone and the polar cone is as follows: you have some of the origin and cones look convex cones look like this. Um, so this could be a cone K. And the polar cone was the set of all vectors which form a degree uh, in, in an angle with vectors from the cone here um, of more than 19 degrees. So, and if you want to construct a cone um, geometrically, yeah, you um, take kind of the, one of the extreme rays here and um, yeah, draw a line perpendicular to that in this direction, and you take the other extreme ray, draw a line perpendicular in this direction. So these are right angles here, and this here. Is the, cone, the polar cone k star? Okay, and what does this theorem, theorem tell us? So if we have k in R d uh, non-empty um, closed convex cone, um, then every x in the full R d x zero. <coughs> Is uniquely decomposed um, as x is equal to the projection onto the cone k of x0 plus the projection onto the polar cone of x0. <coughs> and moreover, and it holds that um, the, the vector pointing to the projection of uh, x0 onto k is orthogonal to the projection onto the polar cone of x0. Okay, so that's it. Um, <clears throat> so the cone and the polar cone decompose this space in an additively additive way. So and graphically, um, probably one should distinguish two situations. Um, what about uh, a point here? Yeah, this is our x0. Um, yeah, then <coughs> Yeah, what what happens if you if you do the projection onto both both cones? Um, so we need to again our uh, so this so to find the the point of shortest distance, we do the orthogonal projection onto this is onto the polar cone here. So here lies projection onto the polar cone of x zero, and maybe over there, maybe like that. That's the projection onto the cone k of x zero. <coughs> And you already noted that this here is a perfect rectangle. We have uh, <coughs> we have right angles all over the place. So this is the right angle because of the construction of the polar cone. This is the right angle because of um, uh, the projection, and that's also a right angle because of the projection. So this has to be also a right angle. And we see that uh, if we take this vector plus that vector, we will get this vector. And also, it's, it's clear that it's unique. If you move around here and, and then somewhere in this point, you, you you can't move that point here. That you still reach that one. Um, the situation is a little bit different. Or actually, it's a kind of yeah, it's a degenerate situation. If the x zero would be inside one of these cones, 
So if the x0 would be here, <coughs> um, yeah, then it's just x0 plus 0. And 0 is uh, the projection onto, um, uh, onto that point and uh, onto k star. If, you if we project this point here onto k star, you, you, you uh, end up in the origin. So even for points inside one of these cones, um, this decomposition still holds. So and um, the orthogonality is also pretty clear from the picture, it's pretty clear that it has to be orthogonal. Okay, but let's prove it. <coughs> let's prove it. Um, so, and what we do is we need we use this characterization from the projection theorem. Uh, the projection theorem, which was theorem 2.9 in our, uh, in our counting. <coughs> we have for all x in k, we have this uh, <coughs> angle condition and let's write it like um, x0 minus the projection onto k of x0 um, in a product with any x minus the projection onto k of x0. This is non-positive and this equation gets a star. <coughs> okay, then so and now um, what, we, what we can use now is that we have cones so that um, we can put, uh, yeah, we can plug in special things for x. So this holds for all x in the cone, so we can choose special points. And one special point is x equals zero. So that's uh, always uh, in the cone in our case, so in, in the closed cone. And for x equals zero, this guy is zero, the minus gets out and we flip the sign um, and we get x zero minus pk x zero. Inner product with pk x zero is actually non-negative. That's hold for cones. Um, and another point we can plug in is um, so we can plug in any other point of uh, of k. So for example, you could plug in this point here, p k x naught or x zero. But then this would just give zero, and there would you would get the inequality zero is lot is or equal zero, which is true, but yeah, not helpful. But we can also plug in x is two times the projection onto the cone. So this we did not use, so that we have a, in the cone we can scale with positive scalars. So in p k x naught is in the cone. So any multiple is, is in the cone again. And if we plug this in here, um, you get two times the projection minus the projection, it's the projection itself. And so we get x naught minus pk x naught in a product with the projection is also non-positive. So both from this here, because you can plug in anything on that ray here, um, these two things. And so what we get is that x naught minus pk x naught pk x naught is actually equal to zero. And we already see that these two vectors are orthogonal. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. So this gets two stars here. So now comes the funny, it's, I, I find this proof funny. Now comes the funny part. Um, if you decompose this um, in a product here into two by separators or using linearity in the second component, you get this inner product of this with that guy, of this with that guy, but of this with that guy is zero from here. So altogether, uh, we get that. Um, so, let's, so maybe I do it a little bit more uh, verbosely. Um, so we, we just take star um, and write it down again x zero minus pk x zero. Uh, x minus pk, x0, and you know, use linearity, it's x0 minus pk, x0 times x, um, minus x0 minus pk, x0 minus times pk, x0. Um, <coughs> and all we're doing here holds for all k and uh, x and k. But we showed that this guy here is 0. Um, so and hence, what we see is this inner product here for uh, hopefully for all x and k. It holds that this inner product x zero with p k x zero times x not zero is non-positive. Okay, but that here just by definition of the polar cone means that this is an element of the polar cone. The polar cones are all the elements which form an angle with the elements from the cone of uh, more than 90 degrees. So this means by definition of the polar cone that this guy here is in the polar cone. Um, okay, that's the first thing. 
um, but we still need to show that this here is actually the projection onto the polar cone of x naught. That is still missing. And if we would have that, then we would be done here. So. Okay. So moreover, um, for all x in the polar cone, k star. So this is k star x in the polar cone. Um, we get the following x zero minus um, x zero minus. So we, we, we write this down. I want to use this um, uh, characterization the other way around. So showing something like this and deducing something like that. So we write down something like this. You want to show that y is uh, that this is a projection. So we consider this in our product up here. Um, k x zero times. <coughs> Um, x minus x0 minus pk x0 and let's see what sign do we get here so first we may note that this here cancels um, so this is actually the same as pk x0 times um, and then we just sort of separate this here into two uh, with x and then plus yeah I do it with plus why would it, yeah with plus maybe with plus um, we get here p k x naught times that flipped around p k x naught minus x naught. Okay, but we have already seen that this guy here, uh, no, there are two stars, um, is zero by the two stars equality. Okay, and uh, but now this here is by definition in k. It's a projection of something onto k, and this is also yeah, by definition in k star. So this is an inner product of two elements, one in the cone, one in the polar one. So this is non-positive. And there we now we have it. Now projection theorem strikes again. Um, this guy is always non-positive for any x in the in the polar cone. This means that this here has to be the projection. So again, the projection theorem shows that x naught minus p k x naught is equal to the projection onto the polar cone of x naught, and that's exactly the equation you wanted to show. So we are done with that and also with this because this is just that. This is the projection onto x naught, uh, onto k from f x naught and this is, as we've shown down here, the projection onto the polar cone. So all is done. That was it. Okay. Good. Okay, so uh, still no answers on the um, on the poll, unfortunately. Um, so I, I may add that the poll is the question is actually um, related to one of the um, tasks on the new exercise sheet. On the new exercise sheet, um, we um, already started a little bit of um, of algorithms. So what the, basically the lecture is more or less the first half is the development of of convex analysis, and the second half is applying this to <coughs> to algorithms. Um, but at, even at this stage, we can already um, provide some some algorithms. And the algorithm we want to consider is um, um, if you have a collection of convex sets and all of them are simple in some sense, in the sense that you can project on ten, onto them very simple. So, for example, it's very simple to project onto points. Okay, that's very, but also onto hyperplanes. It's also simple to project on circles or, or balls. That's also simple. And what is hard, for example, is to project onto ellipsoids. That's not that simple. Um, also projecting onto lower dimensional subspaces or affine subspaces may also not be very simple. It may involve kind of uh, solving linear equations or something. Um, so, but what, um, what convex analysis gives you, if you have a set which you can describe as the intersection of a lot of convex sets, and we will see in, in a minute that this kind of applies to all convex sets, so that you can, can describe them as intersection of simpler convex sets, namely half spaces. Um, then you can sometimes it, uh, still find a point in the intersection. And this is generally a diff difficult problem. If you, uh, it sounds a bit stupid. So given a convex set, give me a point in the convex set. But if the convex set is only described as the intersection of convex sets, it's not at all clear um, how could you, by, by, by giving this description as intersection, how can you define, how can you just find a single point in the intersection? 
The prime example is um, solution of a linear equation, linear set of equations, ax equals b, just linear algebra one. Um, it's a linear space, a linear, it's an affine linear space, so it's convex, okay? But finding a point is, is it's the same as solving a linear system, and you know how to do it by Gauss elimination or whatever. Um, but convex analysis gives you another way to, to look at it because you can find you can view the intersection the, the, the solution space as the intersection of all the solution spaces of the rows uh, of the linear system. So just take considering the first row of the linear system, that gives you a, a very underdetermined um, linear equation and has a hyperplane as solution set. So each line of the linear system gives you one hyperplane, um, and so then. Um, the, uh, the problem of finding a solution of the linear system is equivalent to finding a point um, in the intersection of all these half spaces defined by the rows. Okay, and this is a little bit what this question is also about. Okay, but anyway, we need to move on with our um, topics for today. So that's basically it we have for projection, and now we come to separation. Also, oh, there's an obvious corollary um, if you plug uh, of this theorem, if you plug in. Um, uh, subspaces here, if this k is not only a cone but even a subspace, um, then the polar cone is the orthogonal subspace and you have the decomposition um, as you know from linear algebra probably already. Okay, it's just a side remark. So let's now come to the definition of separation. So definition 3.2. So separation in general means something like if you have one convex set and another convex set, ah, this would be a vote, okay. Ba, 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 ba. Yes, right. Um, maybe I deal first, first with this. Yeah, you're of course right. Um, so first I made a typo again in this last point here. In, in this last point, I wanted to ask P A of X minus P A of Y. Um, so not, yeah, it should be, um, um, so it should have been, um, Something similar like this. Um, this other would also be an interesting question. It should have been um, I actually wanted to ask that question. Okay, but anyway, but now let's take that it is. So which of these is right and which is wrong? So let's discuss that. Um, so uh, we have two non-empty closed convex sets with non-empty intersections. So and let's do just two sets like that. Let's say this is A and B, and that's the intersection. <coughs> um, so first is if you first project onto A and then onto B, do we actually project onto the intersection? And that's no, it's not. Um, so how do we see that here? Um, maybe in this example, it's a little bit difficult to see. Um, let's do another one where you just take linear spaces. If this is A and this is B, both convex spaces and have a point and project it first onto A and then onto B, we're not even close to the intersection actually. So we're first projecting onto A, then projecting onto B, but we're still very much uh, far away from the intersection. Okay, um, so that's not true. The second one is also not true. Um, first projecting onto A, then onto B, or the other way around gives you something totally different. Um, so for example here, um, this is first projecting onto A, then onto B, and if you do it the other way around, first projecting onto B, and then onto A, it's something totally different. And if you do it once more, it doesn't even change, um, so if we project once more here, we end up there, if you project once more there, we end up there, so the third item is also not true. And then there's another typo. Oh, no, that's not a typo. Okay. Um, so the so the first two are not true. What about the fourth one? First projecting onto A, then onto B. Should that still be an A? No. It may, but it has, doesn't have to fall. In this example, you can see that some starting points have this property, but in general, that's not true. Uh, oh no. Then, then this is true. First, uh, sorry, I, I swapped the cases. So if we first project onto B and then onto A, and of course, if we project onto A, we end up in A. So that's one thing which is true. That's not true. First onto B, then onto A, um, we don't end up in B in general. And of course, then this is also not true. So it does not, it does not give you the projection, but it doesn't even give you a point in the, in the intersection. It's only in very rare circumstances that, that it does. So that's also wrong. 
And this year is also wrong, as I stated, because, well, how should it be? You can just take any, so it's just a stupid question. So this is just how it is. Okay, good. Um, but I think you are the only two who voted here, but anyway. So, and this would be the other question I would uh, l uh, like to have posed. Um, if we have two points X and Y, and we project them both onto the same convex set, do they move closer to each other or not? And actually the question to, uh, the answer to that last question here, um, that would be true. That is true. If you project onto a convex set um, and you have two points here, um, and you project them, so this distance here is smaller than that distance. And so in the case of a linear space, it's still true, but it's, it's the edge case, so the distance stays the same. Uh, oh, it, 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 now it may, it may stay the same, but so it, this is y and this is x, so this is the distance here, and after projection it's, uh, it may be smaller, but it may even stay the same. So it's, uh, you, you know, this is kind of, uh, it's true and it's strict. In general, it's not improvable. Okay. Good, that we just, um, we um, sorted that out. Now we actually are done with um, projections, but we're gonna use them now a lot in the what, in what follows. So separation means if you have two non-empty, <coughs> um, or, two con or two sets in general, is it possible to find a hyperplane in between such that one set is on the one side and the other set is on the other side? So, and of course, for a non-convex set, this can't be true. So even without any additional assumptions, if this is one set and this is the other set, there's just no hyperplane fitting in between. It's just not impossible. But for convex set, it's still not totally clear in which cases. So in this simple picture, it looks like, yeah, there's a lot of them. So what if these sets touch in one point? It is, is it still true somehow? Um, and what if these sets are unbounded? May it happen that something is Oh, okay, so okay. So first, um, let's write down what separation means. So these are just sets, um, and we say um, that hyper a hyperplane hyperplane um, H P alpha does several things. First, it does uh, separate separate C one and C two. Um, if and now, so I have something in the handout. Uh, yeah, maybe I write it down. If so, for all x one in C one and x two in C two, it holds that the inner product of p with x one smaller equal alpha, and this is smaller equal to p with x two. And another way of saying this would be um, that C one is contained in this uh, negative half space, and C two is contained in the positive half space. So this is our H alpha, uh, P alpha, then this here um, is the positive half space and this is the negative half. So this is in the P and this here is the positive half space and negative half space. That's just separation of convex sets. But there's more notion we want, sometimes you want to strictly separate. So it's strictly separate. So this holds um, if basically the same thing holds, but only with strict inequalities. Um, so in terms of half spaces, you would say that C1 should be contained in the interior of the negative half space, and C2 should be contained in the interior of the positive half space. Oh, int, I forgot the int. That's strict separation. And then there's a third notion, which is actually, I, I don't use it that much, but uh, the good thing is that it can be really characterized. Um, so this is proper um, separation. So it properly separates C1 and C2. Um, if it separates C1 and C2, so <coughs> we find this uh, hyperplane like this, um, and there exists x1 in c1 and x2 in c2 such that um, the inner product of p and x1 is strictly smaller than p and x2. So we just need separation, but um, at, at least one point um, needs to be um, yeah, when you're able to, to strictly separate them, that you get a distinct inequality. Okay. 
So when okay, okay. So that's the definition of the separation. Um, so this actually is a strictly separating hyperplane. And if but if these two sets uh, would point uh, would intersect in one point, um, it, there would not be any strict separation anymore. Okay, now comes a line of theorems and uh, corollaries and propositions um, on different types of uh, separation. So the first theorem is theorem 3.3. Um, and uh, they all differ in the assumptions we pose on, onto the both sets you want to separate. So the first is um, if C is uh, non-empty, closed and convex, and we have one point which is not in C. And then we can um, strictly separate strictly separate the set which contains X0 from what I know from what and I don't know both is okay. And C. Okay. <coughs> okay, and then in the end of it is a just one line more. Um, okay. So if you have a convex set and you have convex closed and you have one point outside, then you can separate it with a hyperplane. That's what this theorem says. Okay, and the proof goes via projection because we kind of know what we should take, right? Um, if you want to find a separating hyperplane, we project this guy here onto the set and take this here as a P. This vector here is the is a good direction which we can use to separate the x naught from the c. We only need to find the alpha. Let's see. Uh, okay, so projection theorem says um, for all x and c, we have this inner product characterization. I write it like this: um, p of uh, p c of x naught minus x naught, and then p c of x naught minus x is less or equal to zero. And now we do plus, uh, now we do minus plus, um, minus x naught plus x naught. And what we deduce from there, uh, so we, we subtract and add, and then we observe that we get this term also here. And this is then the projection of x naught minus x naught norm squared, um, minus, yes, minus, um, yeah, something, and I write it, I put it on the other side, and what we get there is then I have to swap one around. I take x naught minus p c of x naught times uh, x naught minus x. Yes, let's do it like this. Okay, now there's uh, there's a typo in the. Um, um, in the handout. So, uh, what? But what we know now is this: uh, these points are not the same, because this is in C and this is not. So they are not the same. So this is we call that epsilon, and this is actually positive, strictly positive. Um, and and, and there, there's the word compact in the handout, which is in the, in the lecture notes, which is really not should not be there. Um, so and then. Um, we define p, so we need also a p for to define this vector to this uh, this hyperplane, um, and the p we take as this vector here x zero minus p c x zero, which is actually uh, yeah, I think it's this one, but anyways, um, so we define it like this, um, and then we have from here that epsilon is smaller or equal to uh, p times x zero minus p times x, and this holds for all x in C. So what do we get from there? This means um, that um, p with x is smaller or equal to p of x naught um, minus epsilon. This holds for all um, x and C, so we should could also very well take supremum over x and C over here, and it's still true. So now we have that, right? This is, which means that this inner product for all x and c is always smaller than, strictly smaller than that. So and this is now our separating hyperplane, actually, what we wanted to have. So this defines this. This is kind of characterizing the strict the separating hyperplane. Okay, so that was the proof of this thing. Okay, and now we are ready to prove one of our, um, one of the main results. I announced already um, 
this is uh, now it's called corollary 3.4 um, so if c is um, closed um, convex then I may write it down in formula, which is in, uh, in words there. Then the C is exactly the intersection of all half spaces H that contain C. C is contained in H and H is a half space. And it's exact. So if you have this set C, and you take all the half spaces which contain it, and intersect them all, so because you can move them out very closely to here, you will get exactly the set C. Okay, so and um, yeah, that's basically, it's, it's simple to see. So first um, C empty set is clear. <coughs> it's also clear that C is a subset of the right hand side. So let's call that here uh, so D. It's also clear because D is, uh, yeah, C is contained in all the things which are intersected. And for the other, uh, in inclusion here just observe <clears throat> that if you have a point which is not um, in C then it's also not in here because you can construct a half space which does not contain it so if x naught is not in C so you put the other way around then there exists an H such that so by the previous uh, separation theorem exists an H such that x0 is not in H but C is contained in H and then that's it. So then, uh, then x is also not in D. And that was the proof. Okay, so now we have this outer characterization, and the yeah, what we needed there is uh, the projection. That is the central uh, ingredient we needed. Okay, so you can you can separate a closed and convex set from every point outside. Okay, that's good. Uh, strictly actually you can even strictly separate it from if, if it's closed we can do it strictly so okay so next projection theorem is about strong separation of two sets strong separation um, of c1 and c2 of two convex sets so what we need here is uh, c1 c2 um, both non-empty um, convex disjoint um, but this is not enough for any separation actually mm, well, maybe but okay um, but we add c1 closed um, and c2 compact um, then there exists p um, and alpha such that HP alpha strictly separates C1 and C2. Okay, it's called strong separation, although we did use strict separation, but this is just how we, how we, how we call it. So one of the, so both um, convex and of course disjoint, one closed, one compact, then we can strictly separate them. And if you um, kind of uh, tone down to closed and closed, the conclusion is not true anymore. So one of them needs to be compact. Okay, prove, let's prove it. Um, okay, and after that probably it's time for a break. Okay. <coughs> so, um, yeah, this is now also a, th um, a proof idea which pops up regularly. Um, so what we already did is separate a point from a set. That was one thing. Um, and now we have to deal with two sets and one thing could be to just consider all points in here and there and apply it to all the points but this is kind of difficult to do what is simpler is we define a new set c as uh, the minkowski's difference so c1 minus c2 which is actually c1 plus the mirrored c2 so uh, sometimes you get confused because so if you subtract something things get smaller but if you can cons subtract that they still get larger so this looks like a different but it's a sum and you just mirror one of these things. So this is nothing else as all the vectors x1 minus x2 where x1 comes from c1 and x2 comes from c2. Um, so it's of course, so it's not empty, of course, and it's still closed and convex. That's one thing. 
Um, but now this has now a special property, this, um, this set difference, and, and also um, this is that zero is not included. Zero is not in there. Yeah, why? Um, because these two are disjoint. So um, there's, yeah, you can't make this to zero because to, to make this to zero, these two vectors has to be the same, but one comes from C1, the other comes from C2, they, they can't be the same, so this is never zero. So zero is not in there. So now we're back in the situation before, we have one closed convex set and a point outside we can separate. Okay, um, since C1 intersected C2 is empty. Okay. Yeah, it's empty. Okay, so what do we do now? Um, we need also strict separation and not only separation. Um, and yeah, okay. <coughs> so what we do, um, we define x hat as the projection of zero onto c. So now I would love to draw some pictures, but actually I can't manage. So drawing, even drawing the set difference is a bit difficult. So probably it can be done, but I, I, I tried a little and, and all my pictures were not that, not that good. So I, I just don't do it and we just argue here um, algebraically, so to say. Okay, so this is the projection of zero onto C. So this is actually an element of C. Um, so hence, um, because C is the set difference, we can write it as, um, what I want to say is from this follows, we can write X hat as the difference of X1 and X2. Uh, they also get a hat um, with x i hat in c i for e equals one two okay and now we define um, two things x star we define it as x one hat plus x two hat over two and uh, we define p as x one hat minus x two hat over two which is exactly the x hat actually uh, oh, let's be careful now we take two sorry two minus one now hopefully i didn't get that wrong uh, i had to change it and but the other thing let's see i think it's like this um and alpha um is p with x star so now we say we're going to prove that these things work that this p actually separates um so p alpha separates c1 c2 Okay, so what? So first thing, this p is not zero because x one hat is not equal to x two hat p. They come from from this disjoint sets. Okay, um, then again, the projection theorem um, gives us that zero minus the projection of uh, zero onto c, which is uh, x hat, which is x one hat minus x two hat in a product with any other point x1 minus x2 from c1 minus c2 minus this x1 hat minus x2 hat um, this is smaller equal zero that's the projection theorem once again so and now um, we use this definition of x star to get um, so what we use is x star minus x1 hat is actually x2 hat minus x1 hat over 2 which is p but x so and then okay and also we use x star minus x2 hat is uh, x1 hat minus x2 hat over 2 both follows from here so so if you use these two both two things um, we can deduce the following x star uh, minus x1 hat with x1 minus x1 hat plus basically the same expression with 2 instead of 1 x star minus x2 hat times x2 minus x2 hat and the sum of these two things is non-positive um, uh, i forgot the the contour so this is both holds for all xi and c i so on here also for all x i and c i so you can take arbitrary x i uh, x one and, uh, and c one and x two and c two okay and what we get 
Or what you can do with this is we can take special x1s and x2s. So for example, um, if we take x1 equal x1 hat, which is of course allowed, this one goes away. And um, if we take the other one, x2 is x2 hat, uh, this one goes away. And so we get for both e equals one and two, we get that x star, so both terms are individually non-negative, x star minus uh, x i hat um, minus uh, times x i minus x i hat is larger, small equals to zero um, for all x i and c i. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so and, and now again the projection theorem, the other way around, says so that this is again we can deduce something as a projection of something. Um, what we can deduce here that um, this is the projection of that onto the set. So we can do this x star is, uh, no, 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 not x star, sorry, um, that was wrong, uh, other way around. So this is the projection of that. So x i hat is the projection of c onto c of x star. Okay, um, and finally we're, we're almost done. Um, and so we can do this uh, that, uh, so we just, still need to show strict separation. Um, and for this um, we just consider this inner product, this vector p, which we defined up there with some x1. Um, we can show that this is um, smaller equals with p times x1 hat. Um, and yeah, plugging and uh, adding and subtracting, this is the same as p is with x star plus uh, p x1 hat minus x star. And um, this was our definition of alpha um, and this here, um, for here we probably use again something like, uh, so where is it, x1 hat minus x star, x1 hat minus x star, that's actually p again. So this is, uh, it's minus p, so it's minus p, so this is minus norm p squared. Um, and so this means, um, oh, and this is, uh, what we really need is that this is smaller than alpha. So we see that this is smaller than alpha. And similarly, we get that p times x2 is larger equals alpha. And um, then we get our strict separation. This one here is smaller alpha. This one here is larger alpha. OK. So. A lot of stuff already, but we more or less half to the lecture. Uh, but it's time for a short break. Um, and for the short break again, there's more. There's more jokes. Okay, so see you in two minutes.
Okay. Okay, I'm back. Um, right. So that was um, the second um, separation theme. So first uh, we can separate a convex set from every point, a convex closed from every point outside the set. We can um, separate um, disjoint convex sets if one is closed and the other is even compact. Oh, and by the way, what is the counterexample? <coughs> Now the counter example is like this. One convex set is just a hyperplane and the other convex set is something like, uh, or maybe I will do the hyperplane horizontally. Um, this, this is one convex set, C1. Um, and that's closed, it's a hyperplane. And the other is kind of everything which lies above the graph of E to the X. C1, C2 is also closed. Um, but you can't strictly separate them, so they come too close here. Any any separating hyperplane should be yeah like this. Should be kind of exactly has to be this. Everything larger doesn't work. Everything with an angle doesn't work. It has to be this, but this does not. It does contain C one, so it's not even. It's not strictly separating. And so this is not compact. This at all. No, none of them is compact. Both of them are uh, uh, close, but none of them is compact. So you can separate them, but not strictly so. Okay. <coughs> Um, okay, so um, now uh, comes one proposition, which is just here because we're going to use it. It's not of uh, interest uh, in its own for our purposes. Is uh, it's a property of con uh, of compact sets? Because if you have a family of con compact sets of compact sets as X, <coughs> subset of a metric subspace, so metric is enough, um, such that um, the intersection of finitely many finitely many as x um, uh, always non-empty um, then the intersection of all of them no matter how many there are um, is also non-empty empty. So it's just another on this fact. If you have a family of com compact sets, and uh, no matter how you intersect finitely many of them, you always get something in the uh, in the intersection. You can even intersect all of them, and you still get something. So I don't prove that here. It's uh, no, uh, we just use it to prove the following um, next separation theorem. It's kind of separation from the boundary. Uh, Separation from the boundary is also possible. For this, um, you need C non empty convex um, and a point um, that's not in the interior of C. So I, I started writing with this uh, interior with this with a circle up here, but I find this more pleasant for in, uh, within convex and others to do it like this. So, and then you can separate this point X from, the, um, from C. Um, so then exists uh, exists a P non zero yeah, and of course non zero P yeah, yeah, non zero um, such that um, for all X and C it holds that the inner product of P and X is smaller or equal to the inner product of P and X not. So the picture is like this. If this is the convex set, <coughs> then um, this is the boundary, and you can take any point um, which is not, sorry, not in the interior. So you can even take something on the boundary, and you can still separate such that this, of course, this is then um, on the boundary of the um, hyper uh, of the half space, but that's still fine. Okay, so this also gives you kind of a notion of tangent vectors, or the existence of tangent vectors somehow, right? Or tangent hyperplanes. Okay, let's prove this. And it's different from the others, so we don't need any closeness of C, we only need convexity. And we can, yeah, so when it, we have the, before we had um, a set um, C which was com, uh, convex and closed, and the X0 has been outside, so it has to be away from the set, and now we even move exactly to, uh, it can be on the boundary. Okay, so um, what we do, we take for X and C, um, we can define um, a set f of x, fx, which we define as a little bit strange, as all as all the p which have norm one, but <coughs> uh, the inner product uh, of p and x 
is smaller equal to p of x naught. You just do it like this. Um, so actually, the norm of p doesn't make any difference here. If, if it holds for some p, it also, it also holds for all positive multiples of p, actually. <coughs> so then we can very well norm into one. So we just consider, uh, if we fix one x in here, we consider all the p which gives a separating hyperplane somehow between the two. Um, <coughs> and this is a compact set for each x. Why um, is it like this? Because this is already a compact set, and that's a closed subset. Um, closed subset of the set norm p equals 1, which is compact. OK. Um, well now I want to show that the intersection of all these is still non-empty and contains at least one p, and then this p would work. OK. Um, so when we do this by using the proposition and show that the intersection of finitely many is still not empty. OK. So take um, finitely many x1 up to xn in C and define M as their convex hull. Oh, I hope. There's some noise here. I don't know. They're building something over there, but I don't know. Hopefully this is not too disturbing. Let's see. Um, okay, so now <coughs> they are all in C. M is convex. Um, the convex hull of points in C, so and then because C is convex, you also have M is a subspace of C. And hence, the x0 is also not in M. It's not even in the larger set, so it's not in this. Area. And also, M is um, non empty. All the points are in there. It's closed as convex hull of finitely many points, and it's also so convex as convex hull. Um, so we can project projection theorem onto M <coughs> um, for all x in M. It holds that x naught minus oh boy, there's another type over here minus the projection of onto M of x naught minus any x minus the projection onto M of x naught is non-positive. Um, and again. Um, as we did before, and we could have also used it before, um, by adding and subtracting x naught on the right hand side, we get that the p uh, that the x naught minus p m x naught squared is smaller equal to the inner product um, x naught minus p m. Oh, there's one more typo here. Oh, sorry, x naught um, x naught minus x. Okay, <coughs> so, oops, I'm still on screen now, barely so. Okay, um, so what do we get from here? Um, yeah, we can use it to define the separation. Um, um, well, we need to find a p in the intersection of all this, and the p, what we want to use is, so we can just define it as we normalize that guy here. We normalize x naught minus p m x naught divided by its norm, x0 minus p m x0. <coughs> um, and then we get that the inner product of p with x. Um, yeah, we just, so this is here then actually positive. It's even strictly positive, but we don't need it. <coughs> Um, so p is just this guy here, and the, um, this normalization is just used that you wanted to have p as norm 1. Um, but if you plug it in, you see p is here, this is positive, and this means that px is smaller equal px0. Um, for all x in m, especially for um, <coughs> uh, especially for all the points, um, and so we have that Pxi is smaller equal Px0, and hence, and so for all i, and hence this P is in the intersection of the Fxi i from 1 to n. So this shows that this is not empty. 
So we have the intersection of finitely many fx is always non-empty. We can always construct the point by projecting this uh, this point x naught onto the convex hull um, of this x naught uh, of the of the points x one to x n, and so then that's it. And so now by this previous proposition, prop proposition three point six, um, the intersection of all the fx x and c is not empty and any p in the intersection of all the fx uh, separates c from the set x zero. Okay, so that was that. So we can also separate from the boundary. Okay, <coughs> so maybe that's getting a little bit dull, but we have one more theorem to prove. That's the most difficult, but or oh, no, two more theorems to prove. Um, yeah, yeah, we didn't, we don't have that yet. Actually, we don't have that, um, but we're going to have it now. Um, so that's the general simple separation theorem, and then at the end we have one more theorem, which is um, which is it is very strict. So the first one here is simple because it says simple assumption, and the next the, the other one is really strict. So the theorem 3.8, strict in the sense that it characterizes it when you can separate and when you can't. Um, so this has usually the name just separation theorem. Um, and it goes like this. If you have um, C1, C2, both non-empty, disjoint. Oh boy, it's loud outside. Um, Close convex, no compactness assumed. Um, then C1, C2 can be separated. Okay, so we have closed, um, we have um, convex disjoint, one closed, one compact. Then we can do strictly separation. <coughs> can separate. Um, convex sets from points in, in, in two different situations. But if we only have closed convex disjoint, we can still separate, but we can't say anything about strictness. And the proof now that is simple <coughs> by our previous proposition. We again consider this Minkowski difference, C1 minus uh, C2. No, and it, this is also non-empty, um, closed convex. And again, zero is not in the C. <coughs> um, so if it's not in C, it's also not in the interior of C, and we can separate. Um, so proposition 3.7, uh, we can separate zero from C, um, and this gives separation of C1 and C2. So I don't write anything more than this because we have done this probably enough times now. Okay, <coughs> and now the last one, and I think we're gonna use it in some point, at some point, and this is now a characterization of a notion of separation. So here we always have, if it's like that, then we can. If it's like that, then we can. Um, but we ne don't have any result in the opposite direction. If we can separate, then what is true for the convex sets? And I'm not aware of any other theorem than theorem 3.9. Probably there are, but uh, I'm just not aware. And this is uh, um, the notion which you can really characterize here is the notion of proper separation. <coughs> so the cause of this is a proper separation theorem. Okay, and this goes like this, um, C1, C2, non-empty CVX can be um, properly separated if and only if, <coughs> only if, um, the relatives interior, the relative interiors of C1 and C2 are disjoint. The relative interior of C1 does not intersect the relative interior of C2. And this characterizes. So the one direction from if this whole this is uh, something we proved already, but the other is also true. If we can say separate them properly, properly, then the relative interiors are disjoint. Okay.
Okay, let's do it. Um, and after that, we are done for today. And then we see you again tomorrow talking about um, um, flexibility graphs. Then we're going to start with convex functions. <coughs> okay, but uh, let's prove the proper separation theorem. Um, yeah. And sometimes uh, it's actually important in applications to work out the edge cases. So I would, uh, I would be happy with this theorem actually in most situations if you have convex close to disjoint, then you can separate, that's fine. But sometimes they need to be on the edge. So they should not be, maybe they overlap in some a little bit, but if the overlap is only happening on the boundary and it's, it is and still, and then it depends on the fine property of the relative interior. Okay, but let's prove. So first this direction, which is the usual, uh, this is now the um, um, kind of the more interesting uh, direction because it really, so from a separation, we can prove a disjointness property. Okay, so suppose, that H P alpha, um, that for all X I and C I, we have that the P with X I is smaller equal alpha, smaller equal P of X two. And one of, there's one element which does, does so properly. And there exists X one bar, uh, X I bar and C I for I equals one and two, where we have a strict inequality between the two things here. Which means uh, so such a p x one bar is actually really smaller than p and x two bar. Okay. Oh, so no. Um, more typos, boy. Um, <coughs> checked it, but probably I checked. Does not check it very well. So what we aim to show is um, to show um, if we have x i in the relative interior of the c i's, <coughs> then um, we also have the strict inequality. Uh, yeah, strict inequality. P with x i is smaller equal uh, one is one equal to p x two. And then this would show that these are actually disjoint. <coughs> okay. Um, so because out of this, it would just implies that the relative interior of C1 and the relative interior of C2 is actually empty. Okay, so let's show that. Um, and we show, by, we show by contradiction. So assume um, there exists X1 uh, X i in the relative interior of C i such that the inner products are the same. So we want to show that this does not, it, uh, it's not possible to, uh, yeah, so we assume this one here. Um, and now we need one of the characterizations or the properties of the, um, um, of the relative interior. And this was proposition one eight we know that there exists in positive epsilon such that um, um, such that we have that the point x i plus epsilon uh, times x i bar minus x i this is in c i so, uh, yeah that's was one so this is in the relative interior and the other points uh, uh, is out uh, yeah, so that was how the theorem works out. And so I have these spaces here because I wanted to uh, define, the, you know, this by y i. Actually, I don't need it, huh? Yeah, I, I just noticed that I don't need it anyway. Um, uh, but I wanted to have this space here because um, I wanted to reformulate this into one plus epsilon times x i plus, oh. I want to do it with a minus, so we can do it with plus and minus. I want to do it with a minus here, so then this is one plus epsilon xi, and then we have here minus epsilon xi bar. And of course, e is one and two, both is possible here. And that's now in, in already enough. So this was one of the yeah, this fine characterizations of the relative interior, which we used. Um, and this is enough now. Oh, actually, I. I so I, I need these guys here. So and thus we can say that if we take um, p in a product with y uh, one, 
we just plug that in here in this in this form that is in p with um, one plus epsilon x i minus epsilon p with x i bar so and now um, First, what happens is we assume that this x has the property that the inner product stays the same. So we can, so this is one actually. So we can replace the one with the two here and don't change anything. So this is then p with one plus epsilon x two. And we just keep that guy here as it is. But we have already the strict separation, which means we have here a strict inequality. We really actually make that larger if we replace the two the, the one by two so we make this guy strictly smaller so p one plus epsilon x2 minus epsilon p x2 bar so this is by strict separation up here but this we just put it together again is then p with y2 and that um, is a contradiction to the separation property because we have it the other way around. So it contradicts that guy here. This is now strictly larger than that, but it can't be because this y is in ci, uh, this is in c1, that's in c2. It's like this, so it's a contradiction um, to, let's make a star here, to star. So it can't be. Uh, it can't be that there's any uh, pair x1, x2 such that these inner products are the same. You could deduce that the separation was wrong. Okay, so that's how the characterizing you know, this characterizing direction works. So if it separates, then it uh, if it separates, then we have this disjointness. Um, and the other way around, I think um, that is again a little bit of standard, but because of the relative interior things, um, we have to do a little bit of work. <coughs> Um, but the relative interior has nice enough properties to make everything work. So now let's assume that these relative interiors are disjoint. And again, we um, subtract them, and so we get that zero is not in um, the difference of the relative interiors. And there was one important property that this kind of is additive in this sense, so that it's actually the relative interior of C1 minus C2. So that's one of the magic properties of the relative interior. Okay, now we start um, to properly separate the zero from that here and then we're done. Um, okay, so one, what we do is, um, after proposition 1.8, we made this remark um, that um, if we are in such a situation here, we can work, uh, we can assume that the f fine hull of C1 minus C2 is actually the full space. So we can, re re um, for everything which follows, uh, we can um, replace the relative interior with the interior. So um, there was a remark um, after proposition 1.8, um, without loss of generality, um, assume that the affine hull of C1 minus C2 is actually the full space i.e. the relative interior of C1 minus C2 is actually the interior of C1 minus C2. Yep. <coughs> so and then we can use our propositions we already have. We use proposition um, 3.7. Um, we separate a point from the interior. That is what we already can. So this is a point. Um, this, is, this is now the same as the interior. We can separate this. Um, proposition exists P, which is non-zero, such that um, P x1 minus x2 is larger or equal to zero for x1 uh, in, oh no, for x, sorry, you have to be careful, for x1 minus x2 element of the interior of C1 minus C2. So what is not clear already, um, Oh, that's yeah, fine, that's fine. <coughs> okay, um, so we want to get rid of the interior, actually, and also so we just want to solve some strictness inequality. Um, okay, so what you do is, um, from this we deduce that the set of all axes, such that um, the P with X is non-positive, uh, it, it's, it's non-negative, this is actually a set which is larger 
than the interior of C1 minus C2. So this holds whenever this is true, so this is a, a larger set, so we only have this implication, so if this holds it. Um, but now comes the interesting thing. Um, this here is a closed set, kind of it's defined by closed inequalities, as you may. Um, so we can even close that and the inclusion stays true. So this here is closed. And if we have an in interior or something inside the closed set, we can even close it and we stay inside. So uh, that's no, uh, you know, that's kind of a little bit of magic happening here. Um, so we can upgrade on the right hand side even with the closure of C1 minus C2. <sighs> ah, yeah, yeah. So, um, which means the same that we can upgrade this here, we can use without the interior. So, we even have um, for all xi minus x2 in c1 minus c2 without interior, we still have uh, that p times x1 minus x2 is still non negative. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that gives us our separation. So hence um, C1 and C2 separated um, with P um, yeah, with, with this P, we already, we already have the P, so this, with this P up there um, and alpha we can use, for example, the supremum over all x2 in c2 such uh, over p times x2. This is then okay. Um, and what we still have um, finally, um, kind of by, by this definition probably, um, finally if x1 um, minus x2 is in the interior of c1 minus c2 um, then we have p x1 minus x2 is actually strictly larger than one, so we have one point which is which is strictly separated. So we have separation, and for one pair, um, at least one pair, we have strict separation. So this is proper separation, and this is what we wanted to show. Okay, it's a bit complicated, um, and that's the thing that after so many uh, separation theorems, it gets a little bit dull. Okay, but anyways, um, so that was that, and we go through over uh, over the different separation laws probably once again to um, to see what we've got. Oh, ah, ah, sorry, I have to do the last explanation again because I've been off screen. Um, sorry. <coughs> so uh, probably you've seen already this. So. Um, we could upgrade to the closure here, so we get this inequality for all things inside, and this allows us the separation. So you see that you can separate, but there's something over there, and the, the, the p we already have, and the alpha is, then you probably just take the supremum over the thing which is on the lower, on the lower end of the inequality. So this is just the definition of, um, of the alpha we would need for the separating hyperplane. And then it remains to see that if you have some difference which is in the interior of the differences, then you even get one strict inequality and that's enough. And you have this interior is not empty. This was one of the assumptions that we had. Was here. Okay, so um, let's go over the what, what we did. So the first thing is um, um, projection onto cones. It's a very nice thing. So actually, cones can play a large role in convex analysis. I think in this lecture they will not be a very, play a very large role. Um, they play a role um, if you um, already uh, go to the lecture or plan to and the polynomial optimization. So polynomial optimization is kind of the, the other end of um, optimization. Um, it's kind of much tougher to solve the problems. You can only solve small problems, um, but for some reason, um, which is not totally clear to me how, where this reason comes from, um, you can use, you apply a lot of uh, things from convex analysis in this field. For example, working with cones. So, um, okay, and cones have, um, have nice properties. So uh, they have properties kind of similar to the properties of uh, subspaces here. If you project a point onto uh, a cone in the polar cone, it kind of really uh, decomposes your space and, uh, additively. Okay, that was the first thing. And we have these different notions of um, of separations. <coughs> Just separating hyperplane fits in between. 
Um, the hyperplane fits nicely in between that you have strict inequalities here, that the sets are in, contained in the interiors, and properly separation is a little bit more difficult. You need separation in the, in the pair of points, which is really strictly separate, but only a pair of points. Uh, yep. Okay, um, so then comes the different um, uh, separation theorems. First, if you have closed convex and the point is non-empty, non closed convex and the point outside, you can strictly separate it. So uh, the picture is like this. This is closed. Everything which is outside has a, has a positive distance to the set, which we can also calculate by projection. Um, and this is then al already enough. This is the P, this is the separation, and that's it. OK. Um, as an important corollary, we have this outer characterization of convex closed sets. Convex closed, um, um, uh, it's the same thing as intersection of all the closed half spaces which contain that set. Um, so we have the kind of a strict or strong separation of two sets if they are convex disjoint, one closed and one compact. This is also sometimes very helpful that you can really then pull them apart. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, then we go here. But up, but up. That was the next one. So this is uh, that was the proof of this. So this is strong separation, close compact, both um, convex and both disjoint, and strict separation. Um, we also managed to separate the convex sets from points on its boundary, even. So if they are away from the boundary, really outside of the closure, then we already did that. But we can also separate points from the, um, the convex set from from the boundary and so the picture is here like this you can even take x0 then there and then you still get one hyperplane which contains um, one side contains the, uh, the c and the other side contains the point it's still possible and um, then this allows us to even separate arbitrary disjoint closed convex sets they're not empty of course okay and then the characterization is you get proper separation if and only if the relative interiors do not intersect on. This is also an empty set here. So proper separation is really characterized by the relative interiors do not intersect. Okay, so that was it. And then there's one last notion I would want to um, introduce, and that's the notion of supporting um, half space or supporting hyperplane. Um, so if you have C and a half space, oh, this should be, have a C and a half space, half space H, um, so we say a half space H um, supports um, C if um, C is contained in the half space and there exists a point X in the boundary of C um, which is, is such that this X is contained in the boundary of the half space. So that's the situation. So this is C um, that is that's the boundary of C um, so the half space is everything which is on the side here. The boundary of the half space is the hyperplane. And um, so this is a supporting half space. If C is totally in there, of course, that's one thing. And also, but one point in the boundary of C is also in the boundary of the half space. So that it really touches, uh, the boundary touches the boundary of C. Um, yeah, and then the other notion is um, supporting hyperplane to C is one which is the boundary of a supporting half space. Okay, so all the way hyperplane H um, supports C if C is the boundary of supporting half space. Okay, <clears throat> and what we could also deduce from everything we had above is um, that 
um, every x which is in the boundary of C can be separated from the interior um, by a supporting hyperplane. Um, can be separated from um, the interior. Um, well, from C actually, from C by separating um, hyperplane. There yeah, by by supporting by supporting hyperplane. I want to say supporting. Okay, so this is also one takeaway. So if you have a convex set and every point in the boundary can be separated from the set by a supporting hyperplane. Okay, um, so when, if we would go through everything again and ask ourselves what is what of these which, which we've done is still true in an arbitrary separable real Hilbert space, here it gets a little bit shaky because the notion of convexity, um, you know, the notion of convexity is fine, but um, Closeness, weak closeness, compactness, weak compactness, they come into play and make things sometimes more difficult. Um, and from the top of my head, I actually am not really able to tell what is still true and what is not, especially the notion of relative interior may be a bit complicated in infinite dimensions. But anyways, um, we're done here and probably the highlight here is, um, for me the highlight is this outer characterization. That is kind of amazing. That is a totally different characterization of convex sets. One is from the inside and the other thing has nothing to do with the inside. It totally works from the outside and it gives you, um, and then we'll see that this gives us so much freedom to, f to work with convexity in the, in the following. Okay, that's it for today. <coughs> Tomorrow at 8 there's the exercise class again and then uh, later in the day is our second lecture for the week. Okay, that's it. Um, see you then in case you have any questions in between, uh, just drop the questions in chat. Bye.